I first heard about the Amersham case back in January 2008. Our field officer Nick White contacted me to let me know that he was involved with a large multiple horse welfare case. Fortunately, each of the four World Horse Welfare farms are geared up for large cases such as these. We've got our facilities and isolation procedures already in place, so when we do receive a call from the field officer, it enables us to take the horses in at very short notice. Throughout the day, we'd had regular updates from the field officer, letting us know how the pickup was going, and as the day progressed, we became more and more shocked and alarmed at the number of horses that were involved in the case. Not only that, regular reports were starting to come through that the horses themselves were in quite horrific conditions and there also were some dead horses on site as well. When the horse box arrived at Hall Farm, it was about six o'clock in the evening. It was a cold, wet night and the staff were getting more and more concerned about just what was going to be unloaded off the lorry. The ramp came down and the first couple of horses were led off. All 11 horses that arrived at Hall Farm looked distressed and a little bit bewildered about what was going on. They needed urgent treatment from both the vet and the farrier. As far as the vet goes, he had to do a full clinical examination of the horses to ascertain whether they had got any um, infectious respiratory diseases or anything like that. Based on information that, uh, that I'd received and in the initial clinical examination, it soon became apparent that um, Several of these horses were potentially suffering from strangles, which is a bacterial respiratory infection of horses, which again, with debilitated or immunocompromised horses, can prove extremely serious. I think it's fair to say that if the, the particular batch of horses that were received here hadn't come to the centre, been correctly evaluated and treated by us, um, there is a good chance that uh, two or more of them would have died, potentially. All 11 horses needed their feet trimmed. Some did have shoes on and some didn't, so obviously the farrier had to assess whether they needed to have the shoes replaced, foot trimmed and then left, or whether they needed to have their shoes replaced, their feet trimmed and then the shoes put back on. The horses themselves remained in our isolation unit for approximately six months, during which time they were regularly treated and examined by the vet and farrier and cared for on a daily basis by the staff here at Hall Farm. When you have any number of horses in the isolation unit, it's a really timely exercise. The horses need to be examined and looked after three times a day. And because they're in strict isolation procedure, the girls have to wear protective overalls and protective disposable gloves. And they do have to decontaminate both themselves and the equipment in between examining each horse. So these horses were obviously stabled for quite a considerable time before we could safely turn them out and the effect this has on an individual horse is quite varied. Um, the vast majority of horses will actually accept medium to long term stabling quite well in a mental sense. In a physical sense it obviously um, results in the fact that their muscle tone and, and fitness level decreases but being the, the sort of animal that they are they quite quickly regain that once they are turned out. Turning the horses out from the stables into a paddock might seem quite straightforward, but you have to appreciate the horses had been stabled constantly for six months. They were quite, quite fresh, quite on their feet. It took a lot of strength for the girls to pop the head collars on and actually lead them out of the stables. Each of the horses, without exception, were extremely strong leading them down to the paddock. When we did let them go into the paddock, their initial reaction was to go for a really good run round and a buck and a kick. I think personally seeing the horses turned out into the paddock for the first time is one of the best parts of my job. From seeing them how they arrived to how they were when we turned them out into the paddock is amazing. They came off the lorry quite frightened, quite bewildered with what was going on with them and obviously in quite poor bodily condition. To be able to walk away and leave them grazing naturally in the field nice and quietly for me means that we've, we've achieved what we set out to do. We've actually helped those horses and it gives you a really nice warm feeling inside. Once the horses have completed their rehabilitation programme, we'll actually assess them with the vet and farrier with a view to whether they can be brought into ridden work or not. If for any reason they can't be ridden, then we'll assess them with a view to rehoming them through our loan scheme as a non-ridden companion. However, if they can be worked, then we'll start them on an exercise programme. We'll allocate them to one specific groom who will see them through this work programme from start to finish. 
Once the rehabilitation process itself has been completed, it's essential that we start to look for potential loan homes that horses can go to. Members of the public can, can apply for our horses through the loan scheme and if they're successful in their initial application, they'll be invited out to meet the horse in person. They'll be assessed on their, on their ability to handle and look after the horse and if they've applied for a riding horse, they'll also be assessed on their riding ability. If they pass this part of the assessment, the field officers will then go out and inspect the premises where the horses will be kept. If the home check is successful, we can then arrange with the borrower for a suitable date when they can come and collect the horse and take it out on loan.